Now I'm going to introduce myself. I know one or two of you do know me. My name is Sonia Antel and I'm one of the directors of Action Learning Associates. Uh, Action Learning Associates is a company that's been going 18 years and um, our, core, our core focus, our core work is action learning, action learning facilitator training, uh, designing programs around action learning, integrating the interchange programs and doing that and the facilitator training both virtually and face to face. And I've been with the company ever since it started, the whole 18 years. Now what I want to do is a learning check-in. Um, it's kind of virtual space. I want you to just think about how you're going to be present in this session. Action learning is a very mindful, mindful process in that you really need to be fully present to what's happening, whether it's in the room or whether it's in a virtual space. So I'm just inviting you to think about how you're going to get most out of the session. What's your learning objective? And, and how you want to listen. How you want to listen to that. Okay. Now I'm going to just talk a bit about what is action learning. It's a deeply reflective group learning process. And it's structured self-managing, managed learning, but structured self-managed learning that is done with peers. And it's simple to say what action learning is as what it's not, and it's not discussion, it's not advice, it's not telling. So it's not a workshop. Um, it's got quite a different structure. It's quite strictly facilitated. Uh, there are a wide range of action learning models and methodologies, but for the purpose of this taster, we're going to use the classic Reg Reverend's one, which, which will become clearer. And I just want to point you to something that one of our um, key, key partners or customers, if you like, said, I learned so much from my fellow participants. Joining a set isn't nice to do for a chief executive. It is essential. And Stuart Wallace spent many years in a chief executive set so those would be the things he learned through. And there's lots and lots of applications of action learning. One of the most classic is to promote better leadership. And we do that through leadership programs, through talent programs. And uh, that can mean doing a whole leadership program through action learning, or it can mean running a talent development program and using action learning sets between the input to support the uh, support the learning. And we've done it at all sorts of levels from people coming off graduate development programs to people in Ernst and Young about to be promoted to partner. So they're on the partner track program. Another application is to develop root problem solving skills. And that happens when people uh, look at a problem or a challenge from all sorts of perspectives and totally get to the root cause of it. So that's something we've worked with. Another classic application of action learning is any kind of a change program. And that might be change that's driven internally, so some kind of transformation program or empowerment program. Or it might may even be driven externally, where there's, a, for instance, a merger um, or some, you know, some, some kind of massive change that the market's driven in that way. And what we find is when radical organisational change is, is required or is happening or being imposed, having people be in action learning sets, they become, they become part of the solution effectively instead of part of the problem. And they start taking ownership of what they can do and what they want to do and become proactively involved. So there's lots and lots of applications and examples of, um, of action learning supporting change programs. Another classic, uh, classic approach or classic use of action learning is when companies or organisations want to develop skills, specific skills that are suited to developing in an action learning process. So one is reflective learning. 
Um, so where you, you're wanting to develop a much more, much more learning culture, to have people develop, reflect deeply on what they've done, what works, what doesn't, and look at their part in that. Action learning can really be helpful. And the kind of other skill development examples are, for instance, coaching culture um, or, an empo or empowerment. So helping managers develop people who are, who are develop people so that they're much more empowered. Those kinds of skills are really good, um, really lend themselves to an action learning approach. Normally action learning or traditionally action learning is delivered face to face. And now virtual applications are really well recognized. Uh, there's questions to be asked and considered whether you whether you want to do it uh, whether you want to do it um, in audio, which is, well, we're doing a webinar, but whether you want to do it just in audio, whether you want to do it visually. Um, and it is quite different, it needs much more specific contracting, but there's some really interesting outcomes we've discovered from working, uh, doing action learning in the virtual space. Um, and the two, the two that are highest up here are improved listening. So what people say to us is when they're doing virtual action learning and they only have the, the data from the voice, they notice how well that they, list, they listen, they notice how much information is in it, they notice that there's information around motivation, energy, um, the will to change, uh, they notice certain words and phrases that resonate. So the thing is really striking. And the second outcome that we, we hear from organisations who've done a lot of virtual action learning with us is that because people have used this really rigorous approach in the virtual space, they end up having much more confidence and, and a whole skill set to help manage their teams where they've got disper geographically dispersed teams or where they've got um, virtual teams. They learn a whole lot of skills that help them with that and improve their performance as managers in the virtual space. Uh, but it, it does require some really, really quite serious and profound, um, uh, quite serious and profound uh, contracting. Oh, now I've just noticed that um, Catherine can't send a vote with a presentation deck on. So I'm sorry about that. Uh, but what we'll do is just carry on. Thank you for letting us know. Uh, the, next, the next piece we're going to ask you actually won't require it to go into the survey. But um, because I'm going to ask you for responses. On the, um, on the chat function. I'm going to talk in a moment about the, well, the rules of an action learning set, if you like, how it works. But what I want to get people to do now is just to reflect a moment and, and be really interested to see on the, on the chat function. When you've led or when you've been a participant in any group learning experience, what are the qualities or ingredients that have made that successful? So what makes for effective group learning in your experience? And I'll, just be, I'll give, give people just a moment. I'd be really interested to I can see people are typing. I can see people are typing now, so thank you. So we're getting lots of comments on uh, listening, lots of comments on listening, and that is that's very much what you'd uh, what we'd hope for and what you'd expect. So yes, a critical kind of ingredient in having group learning being effective is is really deep listening. Ah, I've got a really good point here about a structure and a process so we don't in group effective group learning doesn't slip into the um the kind of casual dynamic that can happen where the person who's uh loudest or most energetic takes up the most space so they're really useful observations so thank you for that um 
and I want to talk now about some of the rules in action learning and um, everything that's been said is in, are embedded in those rules. And I think the first and the kind of headline, if I had to give a headline, if you asked me to answer this in like 30 seconds, I'd say that we explicitly set the ground rules and then we rigorously enforce them throughout the life of the set. Um, we unpick them over time. So as well as listening, it's really important to set ground rules so that we build trust. And that means looking at confidentiality. And we unpick what that means in real detail in an action learning set. And we follow it up and we remind people. Um, and the other key ground rules that we have in action learning are to ask open questions and difficult though it is to resist the temptation to offer advice. Um, okay. So I want to show you now how set members learn from experience. And I know one or two of our participants know this well, but some of you may not. And you'll, you'll see this later when our presenter, Daisy, presents. A situation is described and new perspectives are gained because the presenter gets asked open questions. Usually options and actions are come to in some shape or form. And leaving the set, really there should be a kind of a door here to show the presenters leaving the set, um, a door or a step or something, or have to do something with our graphics. Um, leaving the set, the presenter goes out and takes action because they've got commitment to the, the actions that they've come to. And again, there should be another door because our presenters come back to our next set. And the first thing that happens in the next set meeting, six or eight weeks later, um, is we say, we, we do a check-in. And we'll say, if you presented last time, what was the outcome? Now, um, sadly, we won't be in this exactly the same venue again, so we won't hear from Daisy, although we may find a mechanism to do that. But that's how people at set members learn from experience. Now, today, um, what you're going to get is just some experience of what it's like to take part in an action learning set. And you'll get a glimpse, if you like, of, of the protocols and how a session evolves. Hopefully uh, you'll experience, if our questions are good enough, you'll experience our presenter actually reflecting. And, uh, and if our presenter gets as far as actions um, or, or shift in understanding, uh, then you will see how the ownership of decisions are. And that's sort of our snapshot for today. But for the learning and development and the OD professionals amongst you, if you scale up just the glimpse you're going to get, what we see in organisations is a really high degree of ownership of action as a result of people being in action learning set. And if that's part of a change programme, for instance, what we find is that action learning is it has a seriously strong track record of really proven means to change behaviour. And effectively in that way, it operates in a place where individual reflective learning cumulatively kind of adds up together to impact on organizational change. So it can be incredibly powerful to get sets of six or eight people going back into the workplace after that afternoon's action learning, and then contact with the people who report to them, their peers, um, their managers, their stakeholders. And we've got a lovely quote from somebody here at the body shop. I believe I'm managing my team better as their one-to-ones are more focused, and they, that should say they, do more of the thinking and the talking. Okay, so we're just about to get to our, um, our presentation. And before I introduce Daisy or get Daisy to introduce herself, I want to ask you another question. And again, I'd be really interested to hear people's thoughts on the chat function. In daily life, why do we usually ask questions? So what's the purpose of asking questions in our day-to-day -day life? I can see people participating, so thank you for that. That's a great, um, really great common sense responses here to get the information we think we need, to get information, to find things out. And, and that's a really good purpose to ask questions when you want, you know, you want to know more, some, more about someone or you want to know more about something. Uh, 
all those kinds of reasons. Uh, all those kinds of reasons. Now, in um, in action learning, we're actually asking questions for an entirely different reason. We're not asking them for me, the questioner. We're they're asking them for the presenter, the person who's exploring their challenge or their issue. And we're asking them so the presenter can look at their issue in a way they haven't had the chance to do so before. So it's quite a different way. And hopefully we'll see some of that kind of played out when we, when we get to the questions. So what I'm going to do now is just get Daisy to introduce herself. Just briefly, Daisy, if you're happy. Um, this is Daisy. If you're happy, Daisy, just to say a few words about yourself. And then I'll check in you and we'll, we'll start your presentation. So, Daisy, Great. just a few words about yourself, please. Thanks, Sonia. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yes, yes. And if anyone Great. can't, um, I'm sure they'll let us know. Can. Great. Um, well, hello, everyone. Um, uh, it's lovely to meet you virtually. Um, that's me looking stern in the picture. Um, I uh, My background is in um, people development, um, originally with uh, NHS services and homeless women, and now I work in a in a professional environment, work, working with people often in the nonprofit sector to develop their practice um, using uh, coaching and, and sometimes action learning as well. And I'm hoping to train a bit more in action learning. So that's my that's my background. Okay, lovely. Thank you. Now, what we're going to do in just one moment, I'm going to um, offer the floor back to Daisy and get her to present. Uh, in action learning sets, usually um, after Daisy has presented, she would take questions from everybody and there'd be a kind of facilitated structure in place. Now, this is a webinar, so we're going to do all of that through the chat function. And that means two things. You will lose some of the richness of the interaction of the group, but it also means that um, uh, your question might actually accidentally get almost ignored because Daisy's going to choose which questions to reply reply to, and that wouldn't happen in the face-to-face -face, uh, space. So please just forgive us for this um, application in the webinar. So Daisy, back to you. Um, are you happy? Are you happy to present? Yes, absolutely. Okay. I've just moved it so that I can see the chat uh, across the whole screen. So. Uh, so I can't see the slides again. So just let me know if there's something I should be should be looking at. Um, um, should I should I just give a bit of an outline in that case on on the issue I wanted to talk about? Yes, do. And are you happy to move it back to the presentation, Daisy? And we'll come to the chat section. Oh, sorry. Have I changed? Get people to look at this for the time being, because this might help orientate people to what we're doing. Um, Yes. And while you're, and we'll, we'll move, we can look at, see how the chat function looks when you're, um, when we get to the questions. Sure. Okay. Sorry. I haven't realized that would change for everyone. That's all right. Okay. You're, you're comfortable with that? That's great. That's absolutely great. Um, okay. So, um, so the, the, great. Thank you. Um, I wanted to um, bring to, to, to the set, um, <clears throat> an issue which is one of those sticky ones that I come back to time and time again in my in my work <clears throat> and uh, because I thought that I might get some ideas um, to help me uh, unstick some of the reasons um, mm -hmm. that I keep going back to it. Um, it's the issue that I'm sure lots of people um, struggle with around time management. Um, I find that um, if I have a day in the office, which isn't every day, but if I have time to sit down and tackle um, uh, desk-based work, uh, I struggle to prioritise um, and I struggle to, to get to the end of the day feeling like the most important things are done um, and I can, I can go home and do something else without worrying about some something that is still, is still needing to be done. I don't know whether that's because uh, some things feel more urgent than they are, or whether I do the, the less urgent things because I enjoy them more, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then have urgent things left at the end of the day. But for some reason, if I, if I have a day in the office, I, I find that uh, I quite often finish the day feeling um, like I've been working very, very hard, um, but really important things haven't got done, uh, 
and then and then I leave home feeling kind of I, I, I leave for work leave for home feeling feeling kind of stressed and I'd like to just manage it in a calmer way okay. um do you want to say more about that or do you feel that's enough um yeah that that's I think that's that's the headline that's the headline okay okay well that was a really um that was really clear actually so thank you for that so what I'm going to do now is um, open it up to people and I'm going to invite you to ask Daisy open questions. So these are questions to help Daisy think about, uh, think about what she's presented uh, and not suggestions and ideas and solutions. So if people are comfortable, we give people a moment to get started on the chat function. Um, I know it takes, there's a small delay in the chat function coming through. So I'll give people time to do that. And, um, and maybe I'll just start with one out loud. Uh, so, Daisy, when, when you've had your most productive day in the office, what's that been like? Mm, um, that's a good question. Um, Uh, I'm one of those people that gets that, that gets a lot of pleasure from ticking things off. Um, so when I've been able to tick a lot of things off my list and and finish things, that feels that feels good. Whether that's the same as the most productive day, I'm not sure. Um, I suppose there's two types of productive days. One is where I get to tick loads of things off. Sometimes they're urgent. Sometimes it just it's because they've been bothering me and I wanted to get rid of them. Other times it's days where uh, I managed to really get my head down into a into a kind of meatier piece of work and 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 manage to stay focused on it so that I can make headway for something that was difficult. It's a question from. Yeah, I saw some. I've seen some people typing. What? So so John's asked. Uh, what sort of things have I tried already, which is helpful. Um, so I just run through through an answer to that. Um, the things I've tried already are uh, various types of lists. Um, at the moment, I try to uh, have a kind of simple overview on one page of a notebook of what I'm working on at the moment. So the various projects that are priorities for me. Um, got, got this 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 month's one in front of me. Um, and um, that gives me a bit of a kind of um, bird's eye view, so I keep an eye on the overall priorities uh, and don't get too lost in the detail. And then on the left hand side, that's on the right hand side, and on the left hand side, I have uh, priorities for a particular week or particular day just to help me so that I get that sense of ticking things off. Um, that's something that I use at the moment. Another thing is um, blocking out time in my diary if I know there's something I need to get to. What I find with that though is that I put the time in the diary to work on. X task and then emails or conversations or phone calls or something creeps into that time and, and I see the line in my calendar passing through the hour that was dedicated. So that doesn't work so well. Um, I've tried to get stricter with myself about prioritizing the most urgent. My, my, I've got a new line manager at the moment who talks in terms of stuff that holds the most risk. So I try and, and, and push myself to think about what's the kind of what's the most dangerous thing to not do and start there um, one challenge I think is that I'm one of these people who thinks best in the afternoon and the evening um, and so it's hard to start with the hardest things uh, because my natural approach is to start with something a bit gentler or a bit more mechanical the first thing in the morning yeah okay so a couple more questions coming in um, I just want to think if I want to add anything to that question of John's. Uh, of following up John's question, what things have been most helpful of those tools that you've used? Yeah, so um, I, I do find the list helpful because it kind of keeps me focused. I don't find the calendar blocking out time as useful because I tend to ignore it. I don't know why I ignore it. I guess outside stuff coming in slash struggling to focus. 
so yeah, the notebook is helpful. And, and uh, a brutal decision each morning about what one thing I can't go home without having done uh, is, help, is helpful as well. Uh, and, and then kind of forcing myself to start with that, even if it's uncomfortable. I'm going to read the other questions that have come in. So uh, can you describe your work office environment? And choose what, which question you think is going to be most helpful. Read through them. What's happened to make you notice this now? I'm not shifting this. What worked you? Who do you know who manages time work? Um, oh, there's loads of interesting things in there. Um, So um, the thing that, so Sonia's question of what makes me notice this now, the answer to that is that, um, it, that I had two days in the office earlier this week, Monday and Tuesday, and I, and I came home feeling kind of one of those days where your head is full and you feel busy and you feel, I felt cross, I felt like I hadn't got what I needed done, even though I felt like I had time, and yet somehow I left feeling, feeling stressed and, and like the most important things hadn't um, the consequence of not shifting it is um, it's, it's a well-being thing. It's a well-being thing, and I think it's it affects the quality of my work as well, just because um, I'm focusing on crashing through as much stuff as possible rather than really reflecting and scoops. I've got a siren outside my window. Sorry if that's disturbing people. Um, yeah. It's the quality of my work and, and, and well-being as well. Um, Kirsten's asked, what work do I enjoy doing the most and when, when do I do that? I think... Um, yeah, I don't know. It, it's a funny one. The thing, the thing I find, it, there's two types of work I enjoy, I suppose. One is the hard stuff that really gets me to focus, like this kind of work, actually, where I'm face to face with people and I'm really focusing in the moment and thinking about what's happening for them. Um, uh, I'm not distracted in any way. So the really focused work, um, which is about kind of depth and quality. Uh, and then the other type of work I enjoy is stuff where I just get to get loads of stuff done, uh, um, which I suppose stuff that's easy, easy but just easy and quick and, and, and productive. Um, the stuff that gets put off is intensive written work or oh, that's the that's the worst combination for me um, so i've got a lot of stuff to do at the moment around contracting with lots of different clients that i work with and i know that that's been put off and it's um yeah um john's asked uh who manages time well and what can i learn from them Um, which is a helpful question. I might just think about that for a second. When you feel you've got time, it's fine to have some silence and think. Thanks. So I think probably so the, the two people who come into my mind in, who manage time well are um, one personal example, my, my partner, and the other is um, my the chief executive of, of, of the organisation I work for. Um, Rachel, the chief exec, is 
I think the quality that they both have actually, uh, uh, Nick and Rachel, is that they are um, they're quite calm people and they seem to, um, I naturally, I'd say, am more um, anxious than them and I get caught up more in details um, than, than they do. Uh, and what I notice in the way that they approach things is that their to-do lists are very short. Um, they, they, it's quite, it feels quite clear for them when they, when they talk about what they need to do, um, what the most important things are. Um, it all just feels a lot cleaner and simpler uh, and the priorities stand out more clearly. Uh, whereas for me, um, it's almost as if I, I hold too Sorry, I just lost detail at any one time. Uh, I, I, I just lost you there. The outcome is. I just lost you for a moment, Daisy. You, you said it, now? Yeah, I can. You, you, you said, I feel as though it, I hold. You're talking about yourself in comparison to. I was, say, I was saying, uh, yes, um, Rachel and Nick. I was saying, I, I think I've, I, I, I am. Um, I hold more detail. Maybe I'm more more perfectionist in the work that I try and do, um, or perfectionist slash obsessional. Uh, uh, to thinking about um, details and making sure everyone has what they need, rather than focusing on what is, what is the top outcome I need to go home at the end of the day, knowing that my job is done. Um, uh, so Sonia uh, and John both asked about um, the well-being side of things. Um, Sonia asked, would I feel, feel comfortable to say more about the well-being points? Um, um, which, uh, yeah, absolutely fine. I think, um, I don't think it's more complicated than just that when I go home feeling like I haven't got everything done, I feel stressed. Uh, and that mounts during the afternoon if I can see that uh, the most important things aren't getting done. And actually, just just reminding myself in this space of that fact is helpful because it, it reminds me to prioritise not what feels easy in the morning, but what will make me feel better by the end of the day, i.e. having got the most important things done. Mm -hmm. um, so somebody's asked, what would, um, what would good look like for me? Um, I think I'd like to, um, I suppose, renew my commitment to to prioritise the kind of difficult and important stuff. Um, maybe to deprioritise those things that feel satisfying to have got done but matter less. Um, And also focus maybe on um, when I am working on something that is one of the hard and important and interesting things to 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 ring fence that more rigorously. So um, not take phone calls, for example, or not slip into checking an email, um, uh, so that I give myself a chance to go deep on those things um, and and work in a more more intensive way on them. So I get to make quicker progress. Um, interesting question from Catherine, uh, uh, which is, um, can, can you still hear me, Sonia, by the way, just checking the sound? Yes, I can, yes. Yeah. Great. Um, so Catherine's asked, um, how, how do I know when something is important? Uh, which is really, really interesting and important, I think, because I think I prioritise how the people I work with are going to feel about what I do, what I judge that they need or, or what I need um, or what. So I suppose I, 
I don't know if other people feel like this, but I feel like everyone who's emailed me is a, is a kind of stakeholder who I who I owe a response to, um, and owe an answer to or a solution to the problem that they put forward. Um, and because because I, I feel like I have so many um, stakeholders, and there are a lot of people that I work with in in, in real life. It's it's tricky to prioritise. Is it is my boss my number one stakeholder, or um, is my future professional development my number one thing, or is it about um, people that I work with that I know might be vulnerable at the moment, uh, or is it my the client that brings in the most money to our company? Um, so I don't know. I know that it's that sense of competing priorities that everybody has all the time, um, and as my as I get busier. Uh, and my work is getting more happens to be getting more varied at the moment. Um, it's more of a challenge to know what to prioritise when. So Sonia's asked if I had to prioritise stakeholders, what would that look like? Is tricky. So, if I had to prioritise my stakeholders, and, and, and probably it comes to that list that I've just said. Um, number one would have to be. Interesting. I was going to say number one should be mm -hmm. my professional development, um, not not so much training or anything like that, but me deciding kind of what strategic decisions I need to make to get work, to get what I you know to get what I need. Uh, but actually, and uh, I wonder whether a more helpful way to think of it would be between the hours that I'm in the office, the number one stakeholder is my boss. Um, and then outside that time, I can prioritise in a different way. Uh, but if the number one stakeholder is 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 my is my boss, um, and his priorities then become my priorities, so his his priorities would be would be um, the clients that bring the most money in, I suppose, to the company, the clients we rely on most. Um, and then anything around risk. So if we have a, a trainee, I work with, with quite a lot of people in their early 20s, and occasionally, you know, they get themselves into difficulties. If there's anything associated with risk around that, I, that would be that would be his priority as well. And my professional development will probably be last, actually. Um, so. Which I think is probably quite reasonable, um, but that I get to look, think about that once the other things are done. Um, yeah. There's some more questions if you're happy to, to take them, and we've got a few more moments if you want to take. Um, ask what would I do if email went down? Um, yeah. Asked what could you ask a stakeholders about what their needs are, um, and then Tony said, "What's this like for you when you're with?" So. When, I, when I'm not in the office, my response to dealing with emails, which I suppose what, what we're talking about a little bit in a way, um, because that's kind of the stickiest bit of my prioritisation challenge, um, is, is easy because I just, I just basically put it to one side. It still bothers me and it still contributes to my sense of anxiety that builds for the following day. But for example, yesterday I was delivering workshops all day and I, did, I basically didn't check my emails at all, uh, except for one thing I was looking for. 
but I knew that and I checked okay I saw occasionally the numbers cropping up and that did worry me but I didn't I didn't go in and try and deal with any of it um, because I was I was I was busy um, doing what I was doing so so when email goes down or whether I'm when I'm not available in the office that's how I respond to it but actually if I had a clearer sense of priorities and could worry less about the things that I wasn't going to get to I might be able to engage in some way with with that rather than just locking it all down um, hmm. So I suppose where I'm getting to is something about the idea that, that clarity of um, prioritization would be helpful. Um, Sonia's asked who or what could help me um, with this. Not sure about that. Um, I feel like what I need to do is take away complexity rather than adding it in, um, if that makes sense. So. When I was talking about the way that Rachel and Nick seem to approach the things that they need to do in their lives, um, it seems to be from the outside a simplicity to it. Um, the trouble is, when I try and impose that simplicity in my systems, um, it seems to feel a bit unhelpfully black and white. So, for example, if I went off today and I only did work on um, Things for our for our most our most um, valuable clients for the organisation. It would feel like stuff the the stuff that aren't for the most valuable clients that just need to get done today. Um, so um, the, I don't know if that makes sense, but it's 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 life's more complicated, isn't it, than just going through one step at a time. And if I and then there would be the risk that that my my trainees that need attention but aren't sources of risk of any kind, um, I just never get to their emails and their concerns, which which isn't okay. Um, so it's finding a balance, I guess, between all these different all these different priorities, so that the non-urgent but important stuff still gets done, but the um, the urgent and important stuff gets done first. Can I check in with you, Daisy, in terms of anything specifically? Uh, if I'm sensing or hearing a shift in your understanding, and having mm. spent this time on it, but can I just can I just check in with you, you know, where you are now with this issue compared to where you were when you started just 20 minutes ago? Mm. Um. So. Uh, it's been helpful to remind myself how much this annoys me <laughs> um, and how much uh, I haven't thought about it consciously, um, you know, focused on it in this way um, for, for years, but it's still something that bothers me. Um, that in itself is helpful because it's a motivator to, to, try, to try to do things a little bit differently. Um, and, and, and I think uh, the I'm starting to formulate some some ideas for, for something I could try um, to, 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 to try and get it feeling a bit better, I guess. That's where I'm at. And are there any of those ideas that you'd be comfortable sharing or what, what, what how, how do they seem at the moment? Sure. Um, so I spoke, I think, um, I think it feels helpful to <clears throat> write down that list of stakeholder 
priority, the, the stakeholder priority list somewhere, um, just so that I've got that to refer to as a very simple structure of um, clients, then uh, anything bringing risk, and then my personal development, and then um, then also, I'm, I'm sure some of you have seen that urgent and important, I can't remember, it's one of the American presidents, I think, who structured his time around urgent and important, urgent, not important, not important, not urgent, etc. There's a quadrant diagram that you can use, but, you know, find time in my day to, to get the most urgent things done and then move to the most important things quite rigorously. So uh, that would be today, for example, the urgent thing that I know I've got to do by the end of the day and then um, the stuff for my for my valuable clients that is that has been waiting for a bit. Um, and then when those things are done, move on to anything else and I can decide then make a kind of judgment call about what I want to prioritize after that but if I could start each day um, with the urgent and then the important um, and fit other things around that 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 you know that has a, a simplicity to it that might reduce some of the some of the anxiety some of the, 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 the stress does that make sense? Yes, it does. Yeah, it mainly is whether it makes sense for you. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Okay. Okay. Well, I think you know, in a, if we had more time, we could probably spend more time on this. Are you comfortable to leave it where it is for the moment? Yeah, I'm going to just write down those two actions for myself so that I can um, try putting them into action today. Um, uh, yeah. That'd be great. I'll just we'll just give you a moment to start quiet to, to catch your uh, your actions and then we'll just carry on with the final part. Thanks. Thanks so much. Okay, well, I really want to thank uh, Daisy for you know stepping forward and giving us a, and, and being willing to present a real, you know, real life work issue for her in this space. It's, um, it's very courageous and really helpful. Um, and there were some things I really noticed, and then I'd be really interested if there's anything you wanted to add, Daisy. Um, I noticed there were two or three questions when you really were silent and were thinking. And I think it was Catherine's question: What do you enjoy most? Just the quiet and thinking, and likewise, um, not sure whose question it was, but who do you know who manages time? Again, you really thought about that. And again, I'm not sure if this was uh, Catherine's question again, but when you answered the how do you know something's important, I could actually hear a smile in your voice. Um, it was clear that those three questions contributed to kind of creating some shift for you. Uh, and there may have been others, but that's that's what I heard from my side. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if there's any kind of observations about the process or anything you wanted to say. Me? Yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, um, any, you know, anything about the experience of presenting or anything, any questions that stood out or didn't? And there may not be anything you need to say, but I just wanted to give you that moment. Sure. No, I appreciate it. And, and thank you all for your questions, which were really, really helpful. It's it's strange not being able to hear your tone of voice and, and things. Um, but yeah, I really appreciated to, to that. They were very helpful. The, the three that you said were very helpful, as was the one about prioritising stakeholders, um, which is something I'll take away. Uh, I think um, it's, for me, it's helpful to be a bit objective about that kind of thing, um, uh, rather than worrying about everyone um, uh, all the time, so, so that was really helpful. Um, on process, I suppose the challenge from a presenter point of view is just, um, unlike in a uh, set in, in person, you've got lots of questions coming in at the same time. Um, uh, so, so uh, yeah, it was just I had to make a conscious thing to, to allow space to really think about things, which mm. which which worked fine, which worked which worked absolutely fine. Yeah, no, I, I enjoyed it. It was helpful. Great. Well, thank you very much, Daisy. 
um, and in a and in a face-to-face -face or a virtual step, clearly the presenter would only take or could only take one question at a time, and the set also develops some real expertise and experience in following themes through. And we saw some themes here. There are themes about stakeholders, themes about priorities, uh, themes about well-being, and themes get followed um, as far as the presenter can or will take them. So the structure was slightly different because we're doing it on the, on the um, chat function, but it does, does strongly mirror what we do virtually and face-to-face. Um, and there would normally be an extra reflection uh, step where we, we would hear from the whole of the set, which again, because we've got a webinar um, situation, we're not doing. But I want to thank everyone for, um, thank everyone for contributing. And I and just want to see if there's any other questions that have come from this. Anything that people wanted to say, any questions about the process that people had before we um, before we close up? Again, I can see someone typing. We have to give a slight sort of technical technical time delay. Interesting. So Catherine speak how this could work um, on a rem in a remote situation. So that is great. Um, any other questions? I'll just close up. But um, we have got just five moments, five minutes. So if people have got particular questions arising, please feel free. Uh, what, what we find uh, is that the structure and the process of action learning really does reflect, develop reflective learners, and that really helps embed uh, behavioural change in any learning development or organization development program. So we just got the glimpse of this with Daisy, but although thank you, Daisy. But if you imagine um, cohorts of people over an afternoon working on current work projects and going out committed to taking actions on, on something that affected them, um, which is what happened, we see that happen again and again, uh, people actually develop lifelong problem solving skills. Um, and the impacts of people you know, taking those actions again and again can actually be really, really substantial. OK, I've got a great question here from John. There's a, John's asking, are there any special behaviours or protocols when working virtually? And there are. There's a whole range of them. Uh, and we haven't really engaged with that here because, uh, because we're, we're one removed with using the chat function. But there's pieces about uh being specific and actually Daisy was really helpful when Daisy good examples when Daisy said I think you can all hear a fire fire engine or a siren in the background so there's things like that there's um activities where there's, there's protocols where we make sure people turn off their emails where there's fully present fully present we open sets with a we call it a focus exercise but it's like a mindfulness exercise so that's actually a whole range of uh things that can be done that we, that we do do when we work virtually and we really just barely skimmed them here because we had the because we had the you know extra intermediary if you like of the chat function so that's an exceptionally rich uh place for action learning how to do this kind of very dynamic work in the virtual space um, lots of thoughts been written lots been thought and written around whether to do it face to face or virtually Yes, um, if it's something that people have got energy for, um, you know, feel free to drop me an email or come back with more questions. There's a, it's, a, it's actually constantly developing um, area right now. It's you know, very, very dynamic. Okay, well, we've had a few moments. I don't think there's any other questions. So I just really want to thank everybody for their participation, their attendance here, and especially a um, special thank you to Daisy. And if we can find a way to link in together in future days, I would be really interested to know how you got on with your two actions, you know, the um, prioritisation and stakeholder piece. That would be really, really great. Um, great. Thank you all. All right. Well, thank, thank, I just want to thank everyone. Um, feel free to be in touch if there's anything else that people want. Um, and I think what we're doing is getting some thank yous now. Oh, there you've been thanked, Daisy, by the, um, by the participants. So that's great.
Okay, well, thank you all very much. Um, it's 12.28, uh, so we've come in just on time, just about on time. So I'll close now. So thank you. Thanks, everyone. All the best. Thank you. Thanks, David.